Hello YouTube, this is Loki Ulrich. I'm sorry I haven't been able to follow through with some of my hopes and promises, I guess. Um, I've been having numerous issues, such as, okay, I get a hold of certain people, computer getting old, so it's not able to keep up anymore, um, you know, stuff like that, um, so, one of the things I had planned on doing, um, and I still plan on doing a couple of these, um, I guess is the I main issue with the, uh, is some of the games I want to do is either can't record it, or if I can record it and it's an older game, because that's what I'm kind of trying to do is the older games, it's either too long, if I, well, if I can record it, it's either too long, like the game itself is too long, so I can't do a proper review like Final Fantasy VII, everyone's done it, everyone's done a review or a playthrough, I'm guessing, oh, I can't really find it on YouTube, but I'm using it as an example. It's a two-disc game. It literally has a minimum play time of, I think, nine hours. If that. I mean, this this is a game that had a minimum play time of days worth. You know, to do a speed run under a day is amazing. If that. You know, I'm starting to separate it by an hour each, and... God, I ain't even out of fucking Midgard yet, remember? Um, shit. Talk about annoying. Because, yeah. Um, oh, uh, let's see. One of the games I had been trying to do, I'll just, uh, I'm done with these little, oh, I'm not gonna tell you, I, you know... Just like you know, they're you know coming up. No, I'm gonna start using the name stuff, trying to be secretive. You know that way I can get better advice as well as actual communication from people who can go. Wait, I know someone who's already done this. Here, here's their video, something like that. So, number one, one of the games I've been trying to do the longest. Shadow Run for the Sega. Now, I know it works. Uh, it, this is the other issue kind of thing. Because of how long it takes to build up the character and how very little room there is, I guess, is where I'm getting it. That is the other issue. Either too much gameplay and too small of an area. Or too little gameplay in too big of an area. Because another game I was going to try to do was Alpha Centauri. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's just, just another Civ game and all that. And it's another Sim. Yes. But. I like Alpha Centauri for one it has a better understanding of how to put this um politically economics and mil military style sim um you know because you got Civ and it's, you got to build up from, you know, most times in Civ games, you got to build up from the beginning of time. Whereas, if you think about it, Alpha Centauri was, be, um, Civ 5 beyond Earth before Civ 5 was even thought of. Now this was back when, you know, Civ 1 and 2 were out, Alpha Centauri came out, and this was beyond Earth. 
you know, it's one of the reasons I want to do it. This is where I'm guessing the idea for Beyond Earth came from. Colonizing planets. Or perhaps Beyond Earth is the... You win by rocketing off the planet. Well, this would be the predecessor of... Because I don't know, I haven't been able to catch up with the Civ stuff. You know, last game I played Civ was, was well, Alpha Centauri, and I have that in my computer right now. My only issue with it is it won't, because of how old it is, it has all the coding, you know, the privacy coding and all that, so I can't record it. Um, so yeah, um... Also, plan to do some other things. Um, so I kind of figured they wouldn't fall through, but I had planned on some some book reviews. But as I got into looking at the books, reading them again, um, like for instance, the first book I had planned on, Turning Point by Lizanne Norman. Um, good book. Very excellent book. But, I mean, I can do a mini review right here on this right now. I mean, fuck. Even the back has pretty much everything you need to know. Oops. Okay, there we go. You can read all that. Give it a moment. Yes, I know. It's covering up most of it, but... For the thing is, I'm actually giving pe my re you know, my viewers time to read it. You know, I'm not just gonna go, oh yeah, you know, I'm just gonna do this and then take it me later in hopes that you can pause, you know, and you'll go back and pause it. No, I hold it up there. That's my thing. I'll hold it up there if it's something to read, and I'll leave it up there actually long enough to be read without compromising the video too much now this is the first time I've done it kind of properly I mean if I really wanted to I probably would have had to go just straight swink you know dead center of the cam but you know I'm still new at this I'm still working on it um but yeah you know Premise. Uh, Earth won't girl who is, you know, part of the first wave of colonists to this planet. You know, this is years later after they've arrived. The planet's been taken over by this vicious alien race. The Voltagans, if I remember the house. That actually may be the first time I've actually pronounced tried pronouncing their name and spell it, pronounce it right. Voltigan. Voltigan. Uh, anyway. So, turns out. Now. Main protagonist. Female Carrie. Has. I can't believe I didn't catch that sooner. Mitting protagonist is Harry with telepathic powers. Where have we heard that before? Anyway, in the beginning, sister dies, who she has, you know, her twin sister, so, you know, the whole twin telepathy thing, dies. Nearly drags her down with her when Kusek of the Sholin race, a bilateral feline race that can, you know, transform to full arthropod, um, also a very telepathic race. His, you know, he shows up out of the blue, according to her, I'm kind of doing this from the next of both their perspectives, and literally, this is how her perspective goes. When, you know, this is chapter one, pretty much, of how this goes. You know, prelude. 
You know, it's like, it's literally, smack, this is the main character. This is what's going on. She's getting injured right off bat by psychic, you know, pain. She's, she's, is pulling all this pain and, you know, her from her sister who is in the middle of being interrogated. You know, this is the kind of thing that's like, this is what I miss about, you know, books nowadays is most of them won't do this to you. This is book one of the series and it starts off with a fucking interrogation of the main character's twin sister. I mean, god damn. This is one of the reasons I like these, you know, older authors. When I say older, I don't, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, you know, after that, you know, he makes connections. She wakes up the next day trying to figure out what's going on. You know, confused as hell is about what just happened the other night. Comes to find out her sister is dead. She figured that she kind of figured that out already. You know, it's as her mind clears from everything that happened, including the medication and the pain, she comes to the realization her sister's truly dead. She, for the first time ever, has sustained physical injuries from the telepathic link she had with her sisters. And nagging feeling that there's somebody out there, you know, and the book goes over to Kusak, I don't remember how to pronounce it, Kusak, Kusak, uh, there it is, Kusak, so the name of Veltagen is the name of the other race, the lizard type, I think. Anyway, um, you know, comes to find out he's part of a scout ship that crash landed. You know, half of the crew is dead. He is a telepath who wouldn't even normally be there. You know, he disguised himself as a forest cat because, he, you know, they have the ability to still come down on all fours. Um, I guess I might as well just turn this into my turning point review at this point. Um, so yeah, this was going to be a vlog update, but now it's a vlog review. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> great writing. I mean, Leslie Norman is a great author. I'll give her all the credit in the world um so you know it's you know pretty good sized book for a starting book uh, yeah this was back before she's like oh I'm gonna start putting the fucking previews in so so this is actually last chapter and not like a extra afterward of like chapter one of the next book. Because I know later on she gets into that. Um, so this is, you know, only 267 pages. Yeah. But it reads like a fucking 600 page book. It grips you, it brings you in, does not let go. I mean, I handed my roommate this book. And he was like, you know, he's like, oh, I'm trying to find a new you know, book series to read. I handed him this, expecting, you know, oh, it's going to be good, you know, and he might like this. He comes back at me a day later going, do you have the next book in the series? Oh my god, what the fuck? Why have I never heard of this series before? I mean, this was reading, you know, I know he's a fast reader, but he was reading, you know, chunks of the book at a time. You know. <laughs> anyway, you know, they meet up. She gets him healed. 
you know, personal life of hers starts going a little lean, and she's like, I'm, I'm done, you know, I've told you all, you know, this is how things are going to be for me, I'm not following your stupid rules, I'm out of here, and she goes and runs off, and almost with, you know, within the first eight, gets attacked by the Vault Higgins, Cusack reveals himself to her at the same time, while, now, Here's here's a key point. Tele telepaths in Cusack society cannot touch things. Sentient beings cannot bring harm to them because they feel everything. Okay, remember that. They feel everything about a person they touch at all. You know, just you know, it's one of the reasons their handshakes. Or a telepathic way of saying hello, and or instead of a handshake or high five, or whatever, it is literally that. You know, they barely put their hands, you know, and they release. That is literally how they greet each other in their world for telepaths, because of how strong of emotions and feelings that suddenly arise. And come forth. So she's having him find food, which strangely is confusing him, even because he's like, even he feels the impulse, and he he pretty much that alone lets him know, that, lets you know that okay, something's a little amiss here. What's going on? Well, she comes up to attack. By literally the very guy who interrogated her sister and remember they're twins, so she's confused as fuck. And Kusik somehow, after he hears a cry of help, literally, hold on, let me see if I can't read where it is. Nope, later. Because if I can find where it is in the book, I can let you know how much of a section I've just pretty much summed up for you. Alright, so, still Mag and, oh, that's still Valley Town, oh, not Valley, um, still Calm Town, um, let's see, Chapter 5. Okay, here we go. Um, chapter four. So it's literally. So literally, same day she leaves, she gets attacked. Um, this is around. You know, I've already covered what, almost the first hundred pages, in this amount of time. I know I'm running along. Oh wow, it's only been eighteen minutes. Now. <laughs> Alright, so, because, you know, she just sent him off to hunt, so that would serve a little instant right there what just happened, um, beforehand. Uh, who said that quickly below a low bush in a small clearing? I had them grazing so little rabbit creatures, tensed and sprang. A slight second later, a scream of terror sent the animals rushing for cover. Kusak's mind seemed to explode with the sound. Help me, Kusak! The cry vibrated in his skull, catching him in mid-leap, felling him like a stone. He lay there, stunned for a moment by a, the force of her call coming, he replied briefly. Try to ignore the buzzing in his head as he got to his feet and began making his way swiftly back to camp. What kind of danger? He demands, uh, tightening his link with her as he sensed her thoughts becoming incoherent with terror. 
Well, Tegan's. She uh, replies back. He turned in her mind instantly seeing... Uh, turned into her mind instantly seeing her back against this tree ringed by four volt tickets. Uh, how you live, S hissed their officer, taking her face roughly in his hand and turning... We kill you, I know. Kill you, kill again, but later. You killed her, whispered Carrie. Her hand going up to catch his wrist. The physical contact let her, f her feel his mind and he you enjoy doing it, you bastard. Her other hand came up in a round hash, catching him on the side of the head. Valtigan wheeled, stunned by the unexpectedness in of her blow. Moments later, Kusak erupted into the clearing, his face a snoring mask of fury. One, one hand, claws fully extended, landing, lashed out at the nearest Valtigan, raking deep furrows across its head and flinging him to the other side, clearing with a sickening thud. The body caroned off the trunk as it, off a nearby tree, fell in a untidy heap at its base. The others released Carrie, who did boneless, who, who slid bonelessly to the ground and began backing away, reaching for their guns. With a deep throated growl, rose to his feet, lunged at the first, hitting him with a massive blow to the head. There, a sharp crack, and the shoulder collapsed. Pain seared across Kusek's forearm as one of the energy weapons went off. A killing ray took hold of him, leaping forward, he landed between them. When reason returned, he stood alone in the center of a devastated clang. At his feet lay two bodies. Carefully, he nudged one with a foot, but when he saw the head lolling at an impossible angle, he let it roll back into place, leaving Carrie where she had fallen. He checked the other three Vulcans. They were all dead good. So, keep in mind, this is this guy we're talking about here. The Sholan Telepath. And the telepaths do not fight. I mean, this is one of their biggest things. You know, and he just killed four of them. And he just a few minutes later goes, huh, not because he just killed them, but he references to Carrie in an odd way for his society. He calls her Aleska, which is a sort of, I guess the best way to put it, Aleska is a pretty much a telepathic Soulmate, you know, it's only happens between people of telepathic nature and ping instant. So yeah, um, he makes sure you know he cleaning things up. You know, she wakes up, startled at first, but comes to understand that he did what he had to to survive. Almost immediately, mainly because she understands it better than anyone else. She is telepathically bonded to the guy now, you know, or has been since she was nearly killed when her sister died, which isn't found out until later. Um, it's also found out that there's about five. Captain Kiner, I mean, four others. There are four other members of his scout still alive. And they locate them, um, find out what's going on. They start to try to freak out because he brought her. He explains the situation to his captain. Captain's okay with it. One dude, Geiner. Complete douchebag. Turns out... So we get some more backstory on why they're here and why they're at this planet and what's going on. As it turns out, 
um, they recently had two of their planets that they had already colonized, you know, well-established, you know, planets, devastated every last man, woman, and child on these planets dead at the time of the assault. Um, you know, they literally, and it goes on to explain that Geiner is from one of these planets, and he, you know, you know, he, he's got that whole, <clears throat> enemy is right there in your face, and you can't do shit because of one reason or another, you know, um, not equipped because they were only they were a scout ship they were not meant for combat I mean what else can I say they were you know so they spend time healing and you know Kusak spends you know the next few days you know days week I don't know it doesn't uh, Kind of, it seems like it's between a few days and a week that this, this this next couple of things happen. So, you know, Kusek pretty much debriefs with his captain. Um, they start figuring out how to find this life pod that they sent to the planet to survey. It's a survey pod, so because it it stopped sending but they didn't think nothing of it until the destruction of the planets so you know one find the pod two get a situational report from you know to the captain three a fight now get this second fight kusak in fight number two Geiner tries they have a clan and challenge system set up into their society where anyone of the same rank can challenge each other or one okay so imagine these three fingers are ranks so anyone of this rank can fight someone of this rank and challenge them to each other if they feel like they're good enough to go up a rank they may challenge someone of the higher one rank higher and only one rank higher they're not allowed to go too high there and they must only within their cast so a warrior cast must only challenge warrior cast and well, really most challenges are among the warrior cast so and since nearly everyone goes into the warrior cast, since that's their primary cast. It's rather hard to describe their society, because it's a clan and caste base. Now, the caste base does not go off of like it does... The medieval cast or feudal Japan cast. Um, it's close to the feudal Japan, but tweaked. Um, you know, there's the warrior cast, where I guess you could say it's a mix of modern Japanese military with the old, like really old Bushido. You know, they tried to, you know, Japanese has been doing this for years. It's, it's the military, the Japanese military format tweaked to allow challenges. Because, yeah, that's kind of the one thing that no society on our planet has had. You know, the challenge to go up, you know, ability to challenge to go up a rank or something like that. Um... So, let's see, uh, and no one, no one at all is allowed to challenge a telepath, physic to physical combat, so, 
Skyner makes the accusation, first and foremost, he accuses Kusak of using his mental tele tel uh, telepathic ability to manipulate and pretty much force Carrie into a relationship. Obviously not true, as you know, you've already read that's not true. But it's, what I like about this is it, it starts off with these two, it follows these two, it always follows these two, yeah, it spreads out, it, like in the later books, you know, it, it spreads out, and I like that, it, Alright, you know how Game of Thrones has so many perspectives, or, you know, let's see, Wheel of Time, it follows about fucking eight different characters all at once. You know, this one does too, but it first establishes the main, and you know, person or two, depending, like, Wheel of Time, um... <clears throat> You know, then it establishes more characters, and, you know, Wheel of Time, it establishes, like, fucking 10 to 20 characters, and tries to follow about half of them. Well, this one, it, it establishes sort of a set group, and tries its best to follow that group, while, you know, adding in here to follow them for a while, then adding over here, you know, because of... You know, it's going off of, you know, clan style thinking, which I like. You know, it chooses a group of people who, as far as I can tell, later on, every person in the group is a member of a new clan that is established later in the series. So, you know, Kusak wins, but... You know, he's having, you know, slight issues because he does get injured. But he wins. Um, so they go about it. They're like, well, we need, you know, they find the life pod after, you know, figuring it. They figure out where the life pod's at through telepathic abilities that, you know, Kuzak people are like, well, we've never heard of half these abilities kind of thing because humans have well-documented thoughts and hypothesis on the capabilities and the idea of well these aren't the only abilities we have hypothesized there's dozens of abilities and you know Kusak's race has focused primarily on the receiving and sending of information via the mind which is a very good one which you know because it's you can they can sense you know the information someone's sending whether or not it's true or false you know whether or not you know it's complete of what they've said um all sorts of things you know they can sense every emotion every dip in a normal, honest conversation. If it's like, they can sense everything pretty much about that. That's it. You know, remote viewing, which is how they find the life pod, completely new to him. She has no clue what's going on. He's relying more on Carrie than she is of him, truthfully. I mean, in most cases, in, in most of the cases where they use their abilities in this book, all it is is Kusek going, well, this is how we work it. I can show you the building blocks. And Carrie's like, okay, let's go this way. You know, let's let's do this. You know, follow me. You know, it's like, she's literally taking those blocks going, tsh, tsh, come on. You know, it's like building as she goes. And Kusek's just trying to keep up. You know, um, so they find the bod, find out it's in the middle of a swamp. And Carrie's like, eh, we need a guide. They're like, huh? Trust me, we need a guide. So they go to the main town, um, which is Seaport, I think, or 
uh, like the main you know port for it's got every you know it's where the colony colonists first landed anyway <coughs> they get there they run into a character named sky it's kai with an s at the front yeah eh. anyway they persuade him to follow or she persuades him to follow him off in towards the forest Using their travel pack, really, they grab his hidden gun, and she pretty much goes, Freak! Okay, fucker, you're coming with me. He's confused as fuck, because he's like, How did you... What the fuck? You look familiar. Huh? Elsie? He literally calls her by her twin sister's name, and she's like, No, I'm Carrie. Come on. Well, what do you do? It's like, pfft, she shoots the gun at her the feet. And I know this is kind of looking like a bunch of other people's reviews. I don't give a fuck anymore, okay? I'm tired of... Oh, I'm trying not to stab on people's toes. So, I'm done, you know, because that way, you know, because everyone gets, you know, past the... No new creators come through that way. Anyway. She shoots the, at the ground. And he goes, okay, and suddenly he's being blindfolded from behind, and he's like, who? And she's like, you'll find out later. Come on. So, he, they take him off, and she manipulates his mind barely that makes it so that he can't run for some, due to some manipu you know, mental manipulation. Kusa's like, look, we have a code. You cannot simply alter someone's mind you cannot simply go into someone's mind there is that whole privacy thing which i get you know it's a code of private you know of use do not you know the only thing left in a telepathic society is one's mind primarily and barely that i mean you know these people have grown up with telepaths of their their race has a natural shielding against telepathy and they have built technology that actually helps shield against telepathy. So, again, I'm giving fucking a lot away that's fucking three, four, five books down the road pretty much. Um, anyway, or well, technically two books away. Um, so, She's like, he's like, whoa, we have a code, you can't do that. She's like, fuck you, we are at war. The code, of honor, you know, codes of honor and honor change during war. We do not have the luxury. Let's go. Which is fair, they are at war. Code of honor is great, but in war, one must be willing to... How to put this. In war, one must be willing to... Let's see. Not leave a code of honor behind. More of... Mm, because, you know... In a code of honor... It depends on the code of honor you're referring to, because, like, if you go with European medieval, um, society, a code, the code of honor didn't have, you know, dying in battle was not something they wanted to do. You know, that was not part of their code of honor. Yeah, they were willing to fight. That was their code of honor. The willingness to fight. Whereas, Feudal Japan, Code of Honor, Bushido and all that, blatantly pretty much states, die by the sword. Or die a after a long and fruitful life. It is literally, if you were to die a criminal, you have dishonored your whole family. But if you two were to uh, to commit seppuku, honorary suicide, 
is how I look at it. And it's literally, dude gets down on his knees, grabs a blade, thrust once, cuts. And again, and again, now it tries to get up to three cuts. As soon as his head drops about that far, as soon as his head, another guy standing there with a full-on katana literally sits there at the ready. As soon as his head falls, swink, off goes the head. It is a arm because it, it's the closest they could do to an armal death in battle. He is first wounded and then killed. With the greatest honor of having your head cut off. Now, that is why it's so, you know, I'm going off to societies that I have, you know, I'm a bit of a history buff. So I know a bit about history. So it's like, when I read this book, it's like, I'm trying to cobble, you know, okay, where did, you know, my brain goes into analyze mode. It's like, okay, where did they get this part of this? This part of this, you know. Some of it's obvious where it's just future. We can say what the fuck we want. But when it comes to a society built universe, you know, it's like, this is, you know, like, like I did with Kusak's society. How it was built, what it was based on, all that so and yeah so they get Sky he shows them to the live pod they have some you know misadventure on the way they get there Sky's like haha I you know I have we have a ground car you know I'm not gonna blow my ace so like that dude dude I would have slapped him right then there like dude Fuck you. Yeah, could have told us sooner, so if we ran into any real danger, we could have called Farak up, explained the whole situation, because either way, they're going to come because of the aliens. So, you know, they get to the life pod, they do some recuperating, you know, come to find out that, you know, Carrie is exhibiting the symptoms of fever, all that. You know, the symptoms of an affected wound that she don't have. She's exhibiting the, you know, the symptoms that Kusak should be feeling. You know, shock, pain, all that. So, they give her, that's when she starts learning how to bury her mind, um, stuff like that. Um, Sky calls in his, you know, to his commander and goes, you know, when he first calls up, it's like, dude, they're like, dude, where the fuck you been? You better have a good excuse. He's like, just like, look, stick me straight to the commander. Fuck the passwords. This is too important for it. Give me a secure line. And I'm like, oh, you, you have a better thing. He's like, just do it. You know, he's like. This is important, dude. Come on. I, you know, if I've been missing for days and suddenly call in saying, hey, I need a secure line, you give him a fucking secure line. Okay? So Captain's like, dude, do it. Just shut up and let him through. You know, give him that secure, give us that secure line. Obviously it's important. Because I think the commander was kind of listening and obviously like, okay. You know, that is one of the issues, though, with books that is very hard to express. I mean, grammatically, you know, you kind of know, okay, he's shouting, he's yelling, he's not. They use emphasis, italics, bold, whatever. You know, exclamation points. They do the best they can. But the difficulty is... Disturbing the difference between the basics, you know, the base similarities, you know, like you can't tell when someone's being serious or casual because it 
There is no writing difference for serious and casual. You put an exclamation point at the end, it it becomes instead of I'm being serious to oh my god. Uh, you put a period, it's just back to, it could be serious, it could be casual, it's hard to tell. And, you know, in my mind, when I read that, you know, that section, it's like, why, oh why, I mean, obviously you'd be able to tell in his voice that it's fucking serious as fuck, why would you delay him? You know, as soon as dude can, like, dude's probably frantic a little, like, dude, Give me a secure line to the fucking commander, dude. Let's go. You know, he's probably starting you know, on the end of there. He's like, come on, man. This is important. So, he exp you know, they explain what's going on. They get the ground car. You know, group of Terrans come with the ground car. They work out a plan to assault the base and send a transmission to the main ship that they're waiting on. So... You know, they come up with a plan turn uh, for Carrie and Kuzak to go in using their telepath telepathic ability to disguise themselves as well as get around with less trouble. So they get there, they stick in their thing, you know, the device, it works. You know, it goes through, gets it off, as soon as it gets done, it sets off the alarm. They go bolting out of there with all their stuff, you know. One of them gets injured again, um, you know. Terrans blow open the place to get them out. They get out, you know, and, you know. Let's see. Do -do -do. Yeah, you know, it's since it's only like two, what, 64 I said, 267. Let's see, so yeah, you know, I'm already gone through the whole book and it's only been 47 minutes. That's like with a 15 minute fucking intro of, hey, this was always fun. Uh, let's see. Okay, it literally ends with them escaping. That's it, that's the end of the book. Like, hey. So yeah, literally it goes. Oh, and a bit of a really funny moment. Um, so they're good mention of coffee. They make and grow coffee on this planet. So fuck yeah! If you, I if we could find a planet that could support making coffee, fuck why aren't we there already? Right? Um. So, you know, coffee is mentioned really early on. It's like, it, it kept getting mentioned, which at first confused me a little. Up until, you know, it's like this incessant bringing, co like when they start bringing up coffee a little too much or something a little too much, like, <coughs> like cigarettes. They bring up cigarettes, but it's no more so than normal. But coffee, they kept bringing it up every so often. You know, like, oh, we gotta try this coffee. We gotta get this coffee. We gotta, you know, I need coffee. I need coffee. Like, what was it about coffee that's so, you know, come to find out. So, the Terrans bring the ground car. Um, and really funny scene, pretty much. It comes to turn out a really good, strong cup of coffee. I mean, even... You know, the person who brings the coffee is like, this ain't strong shit to us. You know, this is mild, at best. You know, it's it's actual coffee, though. Not the insta crap. Um, so they make some coffee. It gets distributed to everyone. And come to find out it's alcoholic to the Sholins. So, drunken felines all over the place, right? Not really, everyone's been sipping, and except for Kusak, who's had it before, so he's like, du -du 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 -du. he just pretty much chugs it, you know, and it's like, oh my god, coffee again, you know, so. Sh 
first thing was first thing you know it's like huh interesting and you know because what makes it really so funny is the fact that the the two people involved the like the two main people that are supposed to be involved with <laughs> is just <coughs> yanked out pretty much it's like okay because suddenly you know after you know they think and talk a minute carrie's like <laughs> ever the traitor garris Everyone looks at her confused, and she simply turns to oh, what the fuck is his name? Um, like, oh. all right, Garrus is the stolen captain. Who is the fucking? Who's that? Okay, so this is obviously close to her. <coughs> Captain Skitter. So, characters of Captain Skinner goes, he, he's about to suggest, you know, that, you know, that coffee is become, you know, traded. You know, it's like, we get a, you know, like, hey, <coughs> he wants to set up a trade route with you guys for coffee to be sold as an exotic hot alcoholic beverage dude if we could find something like that hell yeah i mean the closest we got is fucking irish coffee and that's only because only well, irish pour fucking whiskey in their coffee and i have to admit that's actually pretty good but or sorry bailey's irish coffee because apparently only bailey can do it right um so you know, she's like, how oh, laughing, and she's pretty much doing the whole conversation to herself instead of going, hey, you know, instead of, dude, it's like, and she's like, truthfully, we should. You know, we need this written up now so that our, you know, our colonies are on here on Keys, Kiss, Kiss, Kiss. <coughs> Okay, yeah. Kais. Right there. Kais. I guess. So, Kais, Kais, um, you know, Kais has a table at negotiations for, you know, treaties and stuff. You know, this would give us a foothold in interplanetary travel and all that. It gives us our own rights. So they, you know, draft something up, whatever. But I, it's just, to me, it's a funny scene. Because it's, literally, she catches everyone off guard that's supposed to be within the situation. By pretty much being, you know, what the telepath's supposed to be. Negotiator and all that. You know. She takes in the natural roles of the uh, Shonen society's roles for a telepath. She takes those in naturally. Like, just like, you know, most telepaths probably would. You know, um, but yeah, this, you know, I implore, if you read, please pick up Turning Point by Lizanne Norman. Very good book. Thank you all for listening. Have a good day, night, depending on when and where you're watching this. Goodbye. Loki Ulrich signing out.